Marcel Proust was an early 20th century French writer responsible for what's officially the longest novel in the world, À la recherche du temps perdu, which has 1.2 million words in it, double those in War and Peace. The book was published in French in seven volumes over 14 years and was immediately recognised to be a masterpiece, ranked by many as the greatest novel of the century or simply of all time. What makes it so special is that it isn't just a novel in the straight narrative sense. It's a work that intersperses genius-level descriptions of people and places with a whole philosophy of life. The clue is in the title, In Search of Lost Time. The book tells the story of one man, a thinly disguised version of Proust himself, in his ongoing search for the meaning and purpose of life. It recounts his quest to stop wasting time and to start to appreciate existence. Marcel Proust wanted his book to help us above all. His father, Adrien Proust, had been one of the great doctors of his age, responsible for wiping out cholera in France. Towards the end of his life, his frail, indolent son Marcel, who'd lived on his inheritance and had disappointed his family by never taking up a regular job, told his housekeeper Celeste, If only I could do humanity as much good with my books as my father did with his work. The good news is that he amply succeeded. Proust's novel charts the narrator's systematic explorations of three possible sources of the meaning of life. The first is social success. Proust was born into a comfortable bourgeois household, but from his teens he began to think that the meaning of life might lie in joining high society, which in his day meant the world of aristocrats, dukes, duchess and princes. But if you convert this to the present day, that would mean celebrities. For years, the narrator devotes his energies to working his way up the social hierarchy, and because he's charming and erudite, he eventually becomes friends with the linchpins of Parisian high society, the Duc and Duchesse de Guermantes. But a troubling realisation soon dawns on him. These people are not the extraordinary paragons he imagined they would be. The Duke's conversation is boring and crass. The Duchesse, though well-mannered, is cruel and vain. Marcel tires of them and of their circle. He realises that virtues and vices are scattered throughout the population without regard to income or renown. He grows free to devote himself to a wider range of people. Though Proust spends many pages lampooning social snobbery, it's in a spirit of understanding and underlying sympathy. It's a highly natural error, especially when one's young, to suspect that there might be a class of superior people somewhere out there in the world, and that our lives might be dull principally because we don't have the right contacts. But Proust's novel offers us definitive reassurance. Life is not going on elsewhere. There is no party where the perfect people are. The second thing that Proust's narrator investigates in his quest for the meaning of life is love. In the second volume of the novel, the narrator goes off to the seaside with his grandmother, to the voguish resort of Cabourg, the Barbados of the times. There he develops an overwhelming crush on a beautiful teenage girl called Albertine, she has short hair, a boyish smile, and a charming, casual way of speaking. For about 300 pages, all the narrator can think about is Albertine. The meaning of life surely must lie in loving her. But with time, here too, there's disappointment. The moment comes when the narrator is finally allowed to kiss Albertine. Man, a creature clearly less rudimentary than the sea urchin or even the whale, nevertheless lacks a certain number of essential organs – and particularly possesses none that will serve for kissing. For this absent organ, he substitutes his lips, and perhaps he thereby achieves a result slightly more satisfying than caressing his beloved with a horny tusk. The ultimate promise of love, in Proust's eyes, is that we can stop being alone and properly fuse our life with that of another person who will understand every part of us. But the novel comes to darker conclusions, no one can fully understand anyone. Loneliness is endemic. We're awkwardly lonely pilgrims trying to give each other tusk kisses in the dark. This brings us to the third and only successful candidate for the meaning of life, art. For Proust, the great artists deserve acclaim because they show us the world in a way that's fresh, appreciative and alive. Now the opposite of art for Proust is something he calls habit. For Proust, much of life is ruined for us by a blanket or shroud of familiarity that descends between us and everything that matters. 
Habit dulls our senses and stops us appreciating everything from the beauty of sunsets to our work and our friends. Children don't suffer from habit, which is why they get excited by some very key but simple things like puddles or jumping on the bed, sand or fresh bread. But we adults get spoiled about everything, which is why we seek ever more powerful stimulants like the aforementioned fame and love. The trick in Proust's eyes is to recover the powers of appreciation of a child in adulthood, to strip the veil of habit and therefore to start to appreciate daily life with a new sensitivity. This, for Proust, is what one group in the population does all the time. Artists. Artists are people who know how to strip habit away and return life to its true deserved glory. For example, when they show us water lilies or service stations or buildings in a new light. Proust's goal isn't that we should necessarily make art or be someone who hangs out in museums all the time. The idea is to get us to look at the world, our world, with some of the same generosity as an artist, which would mean taking pleasure in simple things like water, the sky, a shaft of light on a piece of paper. It's no coincidence that Proust's favourite painter was Vermeer, a painter who knew how to bring out the charm and the value of the everyday. The spirit of Vermeer hangs over his novel. It too is committed to the project of reconciling us to the ordinary circumstances of life, and some of Proust's most compelling pieces of writing describe the charm of the everyday, like reading in a train, driving at night, smelling the flowers in springtime, and looking at the changing light of the sun on the sea. Proust is famous for having written about the dainty little cakes the French call Madeleine. The reason has to do with his thesis about art and habit. Early on in the novel, the narrator tells us that he'd been feeling depressed and sad for a long while when one day he had a cup of herbal tea and a Madeleine and suddenly the taste carried him powerfully back, in the way that flavours sometimes can, to years in his childhood when, as a small boy, he spent his summers in his aunt's house in the French countryside. A stream of memories comes back to him and fills him with hope and gratitude. Thanks to the Madeleine, Proust's narrator has what has since become known as a Proustian moment, a moment of sudden, involuntary and intense remembering, when the past promptly emerges unbidden from a smell, a taste or a texture. Through its rich, evocative power, what the Proustian moment teaches us is that life isn't necessarily dull and without excitement. It's just one forgets to look at it in the right way. We forget what being alive, fully alive, actually feels like. The moment with the tea is pivotal in the novel because it demonstrates everything that Proust wants to teach us about appreciating life with greater intensity. It helps his narrator to realise that it isn't his life which has been mediocre so much as the image of it he possessed in normal, that is, voluntary memory. Proust writes, The reason why life may be judged to be trivial, although at certain moments it seems to us so beautiful, is that we form our judgment ordinarily not on the evidence of life itself, but of those quite different images which preserve nothing of life, and therefore we judge it disparagingly. That's why artists are so important. Their work is like one long Proustian moment. They remind us that life truly is beautiful, fascinating and complex, and thereby they dispel our boredom and our ingratitude. Proust's philosophy of art is delivered in a book which is itself exemplary of what he's saying. It's a work of art that brings the beauty and interest of the world back to life. Reading it, your senses are reawakened. A thousand things you normally forget to notice are brought to your attention. He makes you for a time as clever and as sensitive as he was, and for this reason alone we should be sure to read him and the 1.2 million words he assembled for us, and thereby learn to appreciate existence before it's too late.